Let's begin by talking about the primary respiratory mechanism, also known as the PRM. There are five components of the PRM that you need to memorize for COMLEX. The first is the fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid. The second is the inherent motion of the brain and spinal cord. The third is the articular mobility of the cranial bones. The fourth is the tension of the dura, which is referred to as the reciprocal tension membrane. And the fifth and final element is the motion of the sacrum between the ilia. Now don't get confused here because a lot of medical students fail to conceptualize what the PRM really is. But big, the big picture here is that between the cranium and the sacrum and everything that connects them, you can have the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, the movement of certain bodily fluids, and the movement of the individual bones that make up the cranium and that make up the sacrum so that if there's somatic dysfunction at the cranium, it affects the sacrum. If there's somatic dysfunction at the sacrum, it affects the cranium. And all of these bones and all of this CSF that's contained within the brain and in the spinal cord, all of that stuff moves and it flows. And osteopathic physicians have determined that they can actually feel these elements moving. So they can feel the pulsing of the CSF. They can feel the mobility of the cranial bones. They can feel the tension in the dura that overlies some of these structures. They can feel motion at the sacrum between the ilia. And because there's this interconnected network that runs from the cranium down to the sacrum, when we breathe in or out, these structures move. And if there's somatic dysfunction at one of these structures, it affects the other. And that's why this section, although it's technically called cranial, the more correct terminology would be craniosacral. So we don't say cranial dysfunction as much as we should say craniosacral dysfunction, because again, all of these components are connected. So the primary respiratory mechanism, or PRM, just refers to these five components that are interconnected and that all affect one another in breathing and in somatic dysfunction. Now, if we hone in on item number four, which is tension of the dura, also known as the reciprocal tension membrane, this is really just a microcosm of what I just talked about. So the cranium and the sacrum are connected. They are connected specifically by the dura, which we could represent by these, you know, the orange lines that you see on this slide, and therefore somatic dysfunction at the cranium will affect the sacrum and vice versa. So now that you understand the interconnectedness of the cranial bones and the sacral bones and everything in between, let's get into an overview of today's video. Now where we need to begin is first talking about the attachment of the dura, because after all, if the dura is involved in connecting the cranium and the sacrum, it's very, very high yield to know its attachments for complex. So the attachments that you need to memorize are C2, C3, the foramen magnum, and the sacrum. So you see that there's connections in the cranium as well as connections in the sacrum, and that's very, very high yield. Now let's talk about different types of cranial bones. And when we talk about cranial bones, we separate them into midline bones and paired bones. The way to memorize this is to memorize the midline bones as the sove bones, S for sphenoid, O for occiput, V for vomer, and E for ethmoid, your sove bones. And then your paired bones will be any other bone by the process of elimination. Now the reason that it's really high yield for complex to know midline versus paired bones is because midline bones undergo flexion and extension, so that's cranial flexion and cranial extension, but the paired bones, which are every bone besides your sove bones, they do internal and external rotation. And this will make a little bit more sense when we start, start to talk on the next slide about craniosacral motion. So to begin, craniosacral motion can be normal or abnormal. And when we talk about some of the normal or physiologic motions, we start with flexion and extension. Now this is really hard for complex because in craniosacral flexion and in craniosacral extension, we have a lot of different things moving and you see that on this slide. So in flexion and vice versa in extension, you need to memorize what's happening at the sphenobasilar synchondrosis, also known as the SBS, what's happening at the sacrum, what's happening at respiration, what the paired bones of the cranium are doing, and what the AP diameter of the cranium is doing. So let's start with flexion. In craniosacral flexion, the SBS moves cephalad. The sacrum will move posterior and is said to counternutate. This occurs during inhalation, 
the paired bones of the cranium will externally rotate and the AP diameter of the cranium will shorten. So let me illustrate for you what we're talking about. So imagine that this is this is a very simplified drawing of your cranium up top and you see the sphenoid on the, on the left and the occiput on the right. And then down at the bottom we have our sacrum which is represented by that triangle. Now there's a connection between the cranial area and the sacral area which I already talked about. During craniosacral flexion, which is a physiologic or normal motion that occurs during inhalation, the SBS moves cephalad, the sphenoid and the occiput are flexing, the sacrum is moving posterior and can be said to counternutate. This happens during inhalation. The paired bones of the cranium will externally rotate and because of that, the AP diameter of the cranium will shorten. Now let's also put on this slide what happens with the AP diameter. So if we start from this blue diameter of the cranium, then in craniosacral flexion, when the paired bones externally rotate, the AP diameter will shorten and will go from blue to red. So what you see on this slide is a depiction of how the sphenoid, occiput, SBS, sacrum, and AP diameter of the cranium will change during craniosacral flexion, which again is a normal position that will occur during inhalation because as we breathe, the cranium and the sacrum both move. And that's part of going back to where we started in this lecture because of the PRM. So that's craniosacral flexion. Now let's talk about craniosacral extension. So the movements are going to be the opposite. So in craniosacral extension, the SBS moves caudad. The sacrum moves anterior and is said to nutate. This occurs during exhalation. The paired bones will internally rotate, and when they do so, the AP diameter will lengthen. So here's what we're talking about. If this is your normal position, then during craniosacral extension, the SBS moves caudad. The sphenoid and occiput will both extend. This will occur during exhalation. The sacrum, the sacrum will move anterior and is said to nutate. This occurs during exhalation, during which the paired bones will internally rotate and lengthen the AP diameter of the cranium. So again, let's add one more element to this slide. Let's look at the AP diameter. So imagine that you're starting at this red point. The AP diameter will lengthen and go from red to blue because the paired bones are internally rotating. Okay, so very, very high yield before we go any further in this video is to understand the difference between craniosacral flexion and craniosacral extension, and specifically what's happening at the SBS, the sacrum, at what point in respiration does this occur, what's happening at the paired bones, and how does that change the AP diameter. So I'm going to fill in this slide, I'm not going to read it to you. But this is just for your studying pleasure. So make sure you understand these differences. This is extremely high yield. Now that you understand craniosacral flexion versus extension, let's talk about craniosacral somatic dysfunction. So as I alluded to a few slides back, there are two types of craniosacral motions, and we can say that that will cause craniosacral somatic dysfunction. There are physiologic motions and non-physiologic motions. So physiologic or normal motions include craniosacral extension slash flexion, torsions, side bending slash, ro slash rotation, and the non-physiologic craniosacral motions include vertical and lateral strains as well as compressions. So we already talked about flexions and extensions, but now let's go through the rest of these elements one at a time and point out what you need to know. Now, we'll start with torsions, but I wanna say that in all of these, what you need to know are the axes, how we name the dysfunction, and what the coupling is. And specifically, coupling means what's happening between the sphenoid and the occiput. So with the cranial torsion, there's one AP axis, and we name this depending on the greater wing of the sphenoid. The coupling is that the sphenoid and occiput rotate to the opposite directions, okay? So cranial torsions, one AP axis, named for the greater wing of the sphenoid. Sphenoid and occiput rotate opposite of one another. For side bending rotation dysfunctions, there are actually two different axes. So first you have two vertical axes, and then you have one AP axis. And the naming convention here is the convexity during side bending. So whichever side is the convexity during side bending, that's how you name this dysfunction.
The coupling is that the sphenoid and occiput will rotate the same direction in that one AP axis, but will rotate opposite one another on those two vertical axes. And that difference, because there's these two different directions or two different axes, is very, very high yield. For the vertical strains, we have two transverse axes, and we name vertical strains based on the base of the sphenoid, okay? Now, the sphenoid and the occiput will rotate to the same direction in a vertical strain. So vertical strain, two transverse axes named for the base of the sphenoid, and the sphenoid and the occiput rotate to the same direction. For your lateral strains, you have two vertical axes, and we name lateral strains for the translational direction of the sphenoid. As far as coupling goes, the sphenoid and the occiput will rotate to the same direction, but they will translate to the opposite direction. And because of this opposite translation, but rotation in the same direction, you can, one might say that the head will appear in a par parallelogram formation. So if you see the term parallelogram in the vignette on Comlex, they're hinting at a lateral strain, and that's very, very high yield. The last type of non-physiologic motion is cranial compression. And in cranial compression, we don't really worry about the axis or the naming convention because basically a compression is when the sphenoid and occiput move toward each other. So you can think of them as sort of being smushed together. And this is oftentimes due to some traumatic event. So that's very, very high yield to know. Now, I understand that I flew through these different cranial dysfunctions, but it's not important to be able to visualize them or you know, know what it's gonna feel like in your hand as much as it is to simply know the axes, the coupling, and the naming. So I filled in this chart for you for your studying pleasure. At the end of the day, this is what you need to take away from the cranial section of OMM. So know this chart and then know the other chart where it talked about all the different things happening during craniosacral flexion and craniosacral extension. If you know those two slides, I think you're probably going to get somewhere around at least 75, if not 90% of all your cranial questions correct. So again, I know it was quick, I know I flew through it, but this is what you need to know. So don't skimp on this material because it's very, very high yield and shows up all the time.